Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Don Moore. He is the Lorraine Tyson, Tyson Mitchell Professor of Communication and Leadership at the AS School of Business and a member of the management of organizations group at UC Berkeley. Prior to us, Dr. Moore served on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon University Stepper School of Business, where he held the Carnegie Bosch, Bosch chair. His research interests focus on overconfidence, including when people think they're better than they are, when they think they are better than others, and when they are too sure they know the truth. And he's the author of a new book, Perfectly Confident, How to Calibrate Your Decisions Wisely. So when I release this podcast, uh, I guess that the book is soon to be out, or it's already out, so uh, be, uh, so pay attention to it. If it's already out and the, this coronavirus crisis is already over, go out <laughs> and buy it. If not, then go to the Amazon link. I will leave in the description box and... Uh, and buy it. So because we shouldn't be too reason. overconfident about the prospects for the virus pandemic being resolved by the end of May. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I, I agree. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, let's start with, I guess, a simple question. Uh, so in your book and your work, you focus a lot on overconfidence, but what is confidence to begin with? It's an excellent question. People use the term confidence in lots of different ways in everyday usage and in common language. In my scientific work, I have a very clear and specific definition of what confidence is and what overconfidence is. So confidence is your belief in the likelihood of positive outcomes, your abilities, your superiority, or your knowledge. And overconfidence is when you're more confident than the facts can justify. When you have excessive faith in your abilities, when you're overly optimistic about good outcomes, or when you have excessive faith in the accuracy of your own knowledge. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so I mean, that's overconfidence. Uh, th there's a specific effect that people in social psychology talk about the above average effect and I guess that we could summarize it uh, as sort of a, an effect where people think they are above <laughs> average right and it's interesting because when you ask people instead of just 50 percent of people saying that they are above average it's like 80 on, or 90 percent which is uh, mathematically impossible right so yeah. could you tell us a little bit about this effect and probably because of the current or the, yeah, the, the current crisis, uh, replication crisis going on in psychology and even more so in social psychology. Has this effect been really properly validated or? Uh, the better than average effect is highly replicable. Okay. Um, I, I would um, offer, so it's been in, probably the most uh, famous finding in the, in the literature, the most the best cited finding, the best, better than average effect, is um, Ola Svensson's 1981 finding that the vast majority of drivers believe that they are better than others. Um, a, a quick tangent to make a somewhat pedantic academic point, and that is the difference between uh, being better than average and placing yourself in a percentile scale. So it is possible, of course, for the majority to be better than average relative um, uh, it, it, so, uh, for, to pick one uh, particularly uh, um, egregious example, so the 99% the of the population has more legs than average. Mm -hmm. In a skewed distribution, it's possible for the majority of the population to be better than average. Mm -hmm. um, what Svensson found in 1981 was that 93% of American drivers thought they were better than the median driver. That is statistically impossible. Mm -hmm. And um, so the findings suggesting that the majority of people think that they're better than average, um, uh, it, it might be explainable by a skewed distribution, um, but findings that the majority of people think that they're better than the median are not 
reconcilable uh, with um, a, a, uh, an accurate perception of the facts. Um, the, it, there are plenty of circumstances in which people think that they're better than the median, um, where m more than half of the population thinks that they're better than the median. And um, that is most likely to happen in easy tasks where people feel capable or their performance is good relative to some salient benchmark. Mm -hmm. The flip occurs on hard tasks or when people's performance is bad relative to some salient benchmark. There you get the majority of people reporting that they're worse than median. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, just to try to be a little bit more specific here, these above average effect, uh, does, does it apply to all types of domains and situations? I mean, is it that people in general uh, say or think that they are above average across all types of domains or does it tend to cluster around particular aspects of life or tasks or, or other things like that? Your question is an excellent one. To read the psychological literature, you could come away with the impression that people think that they're better than others at, at everything all the time. And that is emphatically not the case. Okay. Um, there are important circumstances in which people think that they're worse than others when they're not. Mm -hmm. That can lead to what some have called the imposter syndrome, where people feel incapable, they're reluctant to, um, to invest in performance, they're reluctant to bet on themselves, they're reluctant to um, enter into competitions when in fact they would have been successful. Mm -hmm. That is most likely to happen on difficult tasks or when performance for lots of people falls short of some salient benchmark. Uh -huh. So um, an example that I give in the book uh, is, has to do with how people uh, think that their bodies look. Um, most of us think that we are, our naked bodies are less attractive than those of us, others. This mistaken impression can arise from the fact that the naked bodies we are most likely to see are those of beautiful, fit, sexy young models, um, mm -hmm. whose moles, stretch marks, and imperfections have all been airbrushed out and whose pubic hair is perfectly quaffed. Um, it is also the case that we are more personally familiar with the imperfections of, of our own bodies. Mm -hmm. And so it's easy to feel like we're worse than others on that dimension. And other challenging dimensions, people routinely feel that they're worse than others on difficult tasks. When it comes to... Um, challenging domains. When I ask my MBA students, how many companies will you found in your lifetime? The, um, uh, I ask them to put themselves on a percentile scale. The average percentile ranking is well below the 50th percentile. When I ask them, how many lives will you save in your lifetime? The average ranking is well below the 50th percentile. So it's common for people to think that they're worse than others and worse than the median when they're actually not. And that happens in difficult tasks and in domains where performance is bad relative to some salient benchmark. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, could we talk about also underconfidence? I mean, we're focusing mostly on overconfidence because I guess that's something that gathers more attention or that people are more interested in. But uh, there are also circumstances where people are less confident than they would, uh, that, than they should reasonably be. Correct. Yes, indeed, that is that is definitely the case. And underconfidence has profound consequences in life. There are lots of circumstances in which we underestimate mm -hmm. our performance. Um, the uh, the salient domain that comes to mind for me when it comes uh, to underestimation is control. Yeah. There are plenty of circumstances in life where the individual has a great deal of control, sometimes uh, sole executive control over some important outcome, but nevertheless acts as if they lack control. Mm -hmm. um, examples that come to mind for me include substance usage and weight gain some people give up uh, attempting to do better uh, on these 
uh, in these domains because they feel as if they lack control. Uh The truth is they're the only one who has control. And that's not to say that asserting control is easy, but they nevertheless have control. And to give up control is a mistake. So there are lots of circumstances in life in which we have a great deal of control, but we act as if we don't or we give up. Um, That stands in contrast to what psychologists have studied under the heading of um, uh, the illusion of control, wherein people assert control in situations where they actually have none. These would qualify, uh, situations that would qualify under the illusion of control include chance events uh, where people try to exert some sort of superstitious level of control by um, engaging in um, uh, magical or um, uh, sort of um, uh, superstitious behavior that that really has no influence on the outcome that they care about. Mm-hmm. Right, and uh, perhaps we could also connect that a little bit with the. Um, I mean, I, I'm missing now the first word, but the attribution error where people uh, think about, for example, something happens and they attribute uh, a guilt or or uh, or also. Um, merit to people who can perform certain kinds of tasks or are able to do certain kinds of things uh, and and they say that for for example when something bad happens to them then it's basically the circumstances that are at fault it's not really them but when they are able to perform uh, in a good way or they obtain something positive in their lives then they tend to be more dispositional, let's say. So we could we can also connect the the what we're talking about with that kind of phenomenon, right? Yes, indeed. Yeah. So um, some of the effects you're describing um, are rationalizable if we imagine that people intend success. So when they succeed, they can plausibly say, "Yeah, I intended that." and take credit for it. Whereas when people fail, they rarely intend failure. And so they can plausibly deny, I didn't intend that. Um, (laughs) It must be due to some other cause. But of course, um, in any given instance, there's a complex interplay of individual agency, the degree to which you can assert control over some outcome and external factors outside of your control influencing your performance. Yeah, Uh, and I mean, I'm I'm not sure if you're interested in trying to apply uh, some sort of, for example, evolutionary lens to explain where these sorts of phenomena like overconfidence come from, where they stem from, but what would you say even from a social psychological perspective that people have to gain from being overconfident? Your question is an excellent one. Um, Evolutionary explanations are important to consider and at some level must be true. Mm -hmm. We evolved. Sure. And the features of our um, brains that come uh, pre-prepared to orient our thinking in particular ways were no doubt influenced by the ancestral environment in which we evolved. That is undeniable. The infuriating feature of every evolutionary explanation is that it posits some ancestral environment whose influences we can speculate about endlessly, but we cannot test. And in that sense... So uh, let me just interrupt you there. You're mentioning, you're referring to that concept that evolutionary psychologists like Lee the Cosmides and John Tooby call the evolutionary... uh, environment of adaptiveness or something like that right. um, more broadly than that it's impossible okay. we can't know for certain the conditions under which our ancestors on the african savanna evolved and so yeah. can only speculate about the evolutionary pressures present in those circumstances and it is um, distressingly easy to be able to make up stories um, by imagining some uh, ancestral evolutionary pressure that could have made some idiosyncratic feature of uh, human traits adaptive in that context. And it's, um, we can't run tests. 
to verify that any particular feature of human psychology or physiology was actually influenced by evolutionary pressures. Yeah, so there's maybe, endless speculation. Maybe at best we have some proxies nowadays, like uh, studying uh, hunter gatherer societies, modern hunter gatherer societies. Right. And w the degree to which they're similar to the yeah. um, ancestral environment in which uh, our forebears evolved is, yeah. again, a matter of, of active hot debate. But um, it, it is undeniably the case that there are circumstances in which the expression of confidence is very useful to individuals in, in modern society, independent of whether they were useful to our ancestors. And no doubt they were. So... Um, Confidence gives you the courage to enter competitions, and that is essential. It's an essential input to wise decision making. You, as an individual seeking your own self interest, want to make wise choices about which competitions to enter. If the expected value of entry is positive, yes, you should go for it. And under confidence dissuades us from entering competitions at which we could have been successful. So that courage is essential to wise decision making. How brave should you be? You should be as brave as the facts can justify. If the expected value of entry is positive, go for it. Mm -hmm. But deluding yourself into thinking you're gonna succeed when you're not, is of questionable value. Mm -hmm. Now, your question gets at this interesting domain of social expression and the degree to which it's useful for me to express confidence because it persuades others yeah. to believe in me. Mm -hmm. It's possible that by expressing confidence in myself, I can attract investors in my startup company. Yeah. I can attract customers and employees and that confident, or I can attract voters. Politicians express a great deal of confidence about all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, and, 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 and also mates, right? Exactly. Yes, it can yeah. be useful for attracting mates. People find confidence attractive in others. Mm -hmm. So um, that raises interesting questions about the circumstances under which such a display is may be beneficial to the individual. Mm -hmm. My research suggests that there are lots of circumstances in which um, the display of confidence is helpful. It gains you status in social groups. Um, it is more likely to get people to bet on you or invest in you or commit to you. But it comes with risks because if the confidence you've expressed is actually overconfidence, it runs the risk of being exposed mm -hmm. as delusion or lies or hypocrisy and then that will cost you social status following that exposure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm not sure if I will frame this question correctly, but let me try. Uh, do you think that uh, at least to motivate us to try to achieve certain complicated goals or to perform certain difficult tasks that it is in some way healthy or positive for us to be and at least to a certain point overconfident just for us to get that impulse let's say to do things and then when we're already doing them then maybe backing uh, backing down a little bit or something like that your question is an excellent one and gets at this large literature in psychology on positive illusions that has made the argument that um, well-adapted, happy people are moderately delusional. That, that is mm -hmm. that they have positive illusions that lead them to think better of themselves, to believe in themselves a little bit more than the facts justify. And the best evidence in favor of those sorts of positive illusions come from studies, correlational studies showing that those who believe in themselves are more likely to succeed, that um, confident athletes are more likely to win, that confident politicians are more likely to get elected, that confident optimistic cancer patients are more likely to survive their cancer. But all of those correlational studies suffer from a profound flaw that 
jeopardizes the conclusion that positive illusions are adaptive. And that is the possibility that these athletes, politicians, and cancer patients actually have some useful information about how good they are or how mm -hmm. severe their cancer is. Yeah. And they're confident, not because they're suffering from positive illusions, but because they have good reason to be confident. And that good reason predicts their positive outcomes. So scientifically, how can we resolve th that issue? Well, the cleanest, strongest evidence would come from an experiment in which you manipulate confidence and observe its effect on performance. It's hard to do that ethically with cancer patients or with athletes or with politicians, but um, I went and asked uh, my research participants for their suggestions of domains when they thought confidence would matter most. And they gave us a long list of domains, everything from performance on math tests and trivia tests to performance uh, as um, a lover. And um, some of them would, were more amenable to testing. We didn't test our per participants' performance in bed, uh, but we did give them math and trivia quizzes and did manipulate their confidence in themselves. The evidence we got from our research did not support the notion that uh, confidence actually helps performance. And just to be clear, this is manipulated confidence. So some people we told, you're gonna do great at this task. You should have every reason to be confident about your performance. Now that is a manipulation of confidence independent of actual ability at math or the ability to answer trivia questions or the other tasks, the athletic tasks that we use in our lab. And so there's reason to worry that our manipulation of confidence um, was different from the way confidence manifests itself in real life. And I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to those concerns. But if the question is whether you should fool yourself into being more confident, I don't think the evidence supports that so, sort of self-deception is actually beneficial. And in fact, it can get you into trouble if it leads you to undertake risks that will fail or to behave in arrogant ways that wind up um, being contradicted by the facts or making you look like an overconfident jerk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also, as you mentioned, uh, being an overconfident jerk can make you lose relationships with other people, right? So it's not that people like other uh, that much other people that are arrogant and uh, self-centered and, and they think they are able to achieve anything at any cost or something like that, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, let, let me ask you now about another phenomenon that I guess also ties a little bit with something that you mentioned in your last answer that uh, had to do with, um, for example, people uh, generating or having some illusions that might be useful for them to act in certain ways that go, uh, that are in their interest, let's say. There's this phenomenon of ambiguity aversion. So how does it connect with uh, confidence and uh, overconfidence in this case? Yeah, I, thanks for the question. I don't see those phenomena as intimately related. Um, ambiguity aversion leads people to um, avoid situations or decline prospects or bets that are ambiguous where we don't understand the probabilities involved. And um, you might think that someone who is more capable, someone who's more confident um, would encounter fewer such ambiguous situations because they have a better understanding of the probabilities at work. Um, there is a conspicuous example in the literature um, of the argument that overconfidence is useful because it helps us overcome our natural tendency toward risk aversion. Mm -hmm. um, and that the combination of timid cho choices and bold forecasts help people be better calibrated. Yeah. Um, while um, I don't, I can't rule out the possibility that some there are circumstances in which these two biases counteract each other. 
Um, it's not a particularly parsimonious scientific explanation that holds that we have these two opposing biases and imagines that somehow they perfectly balance each other. Of course they don't. Um, and I'm skeptical of the notion that they somehow evolve together. Um, again, not very parsimonious. It would be better to design an organism that's just well calibrated and has accurate beliefs about the truth. Mm -hmm. Right. And what about uh, over precision? I mean, what is it about and does it connect with overconfidence or not? Thanks for that question. A great deal of my scholarly work attempts to distinguish the different ways in which overconfidence has been studied. Overestimation is thinking that you're better than you are. Overplacement is thinking that you're better than others when you're not. That's a uh, better than average effect. And over precision is the excessive faith that you know the truth. Mm -hmm. It manifests itself in all sorts of different ways. Um, often people being inappropriately sure that they're correct or that they're right, denigrating the perspectives and the insights that others have to offer, being reluctant to listen to others' advice and being too willing to act or to bet on their own beliefs. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and uh, we've already mentioned or went through uh, different situations and contexts and things like that uh, where people tend to be overconfident or underconfident. But are there different forms of overconfidence or is it one single phenomenon? No, there are different forms and they don't move together. It's not like there's an underlying personality trait that makes you likely to overestimate your ability to deliver projects on time and be over precise in your judgment. In fact, in my research, I routinely find people being underconfident in some domains and overconfident in others. When I ask people how they've performed on tests in my lab, they will routinely underestimate performance but be over precise in that estimate. That is, they tell me, oh, I did terribly on that test and I'm sure I didn't get more than one or two right, when in fact they got four right. So um, the different types of overconfidence and underconfidence can, be, can exist simultaneously and in inconsistent ways in the same domain. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so I, I guess that we've been talking mostly how uh, underconfidence and overconfidence affect decision-making processes or mechanisms. But uh, are there other psychological aspects like, for example, I don't know, emotional aspects and things like that that you also study and care about and does overconfidence and underconfidence influence how people feel without necessarily having to think how it will affect directly their decisions? Your question is a good one and gets at a profound issue related to the experience of confidence. Mm -hmm. In my studies, I'm uh, focusing in on overconfidence. And so I must have some elicitation of confidence that is amenable to factual verification. I ask people how good they are and, uh, and elicit reports on a scale from zero to 100. Uh, what, how, what percentage did you get right on this test? Or what percentage of other people are you better than? Or how... How likely is it that you're right about this opinion that you hold? Mm -hmm. I have to be able to get um, verifiable or falsifiable beliefs. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that those sorts of factual beliefs are only very weakly connected with people's emotional experience of that reality. Um, I struggled for a while to find correlations between my measures of confidence and measures of optimism, such as the life orientation test, one of the classic measures of, of optimism. Yeah. And uh, I had lunch with the, the, the test's author, Michael Shire, a colleague at Carnegie Mellon University, and confessed to him, I can't get my measures of overconfidence to correlate with your optimism scale. And to my profound astonishment, he said, oh, I wouldn't have expected it to correlate. 
I was amazed. And, and yeah, I've yeah, spent yeah. years thinking about that response. It's true. I, I, I often measure optimism and it is very weakly correlated with the overconfidence that I measure, even when I'm focusing on beliefs about future events. When I ask, for instance, what's your probability of living past 70? Or what's your probability of contracting the coronavirus? Or what's your probability of getting divorced or going bankrupt? Those probability estimates are weakly correlated with the optimism people report feeling about their, the future of their lives. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the answer to explaining that dissociation comes from the fact that our feelings about our state of, of well-being um, are so strongly driven by the counterfactuals we imagine mm -hmm. that it's possible to um, be privileged, wealthy, prosperous, fortunate, but nevertheless feel bad because we have less than others. In my book, I tell the story of the French billionaire who invested a substantial portion of his fortune with Bernie Madoff. Yeah. When he found out that Madoff had been running a Ponzi scheme and that his money had been lost, he locked himself in his New York office and slit his wrists. Mm -hmm. He was still one of the richest people in the world, <laughs> but his failure to have anticipated Madoff's deception made him feel so bad that it led him to consider to act on an impulse to suicide. There are people, there are poor, sick people living in urban slums, vulnerable to many of life's most vicious privations who nevertheless go through life happy. Mm -hmm because perhaps they have social connections with people that they care about. They live in a supportive social circumstance and they're fortunate that they're better off than others that they know. Mm -hmm. Our feelings about our life are only very distantly connected to the facts of how wealthy we are or how long we are likely to live. And so I think people have choices about how to feel about the facts of their lives that strongly recommend feeling good. If you have a choice about whether to feel bad or feel good about your circumstances, by all means, feel good about it. That doesn't mean lying to yourself about the facts. Yeah, yeah. So, so th that's interesting. So there's not necessarily a connection between uh, how we feel about, for example, our circumstances and uh, having a realistic view of how they are. That connection is astonishingly weak. Mm -hmm. And no matter how bad you've got it, it's always possible to find someone else who's worse off. Yeah. And no matter how fortunate and prosperous you are, it is possible to look at someone else who has more and feel bad about your circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure to what extent this is true, but it seems to me that there are also people out there that sort of thrive in bad circumstances. I, I mean, they, they feel good, by, by having to overcome obstacles, for example. Yeah, yeah. And there are, it's easy to think of circumstances uh, where people challenge themselves that way. Um, I know plenty of avid uh, wilderness adventurers and mountain climbers who will happily admit that being out there on the mountain, freezing, and in, at risk of dying any second should a foot slip on the climb, like that's scary and it's mm -hmm. uncomfortable and it's lonely, but that the thrill of adventure drives them on. Yeah. And they intentionally seek out exactly those sorts of challenges because it makes them feel alive. Um, 
which raises interesting questions for how we think about utility. But I completely agree that there's some people who thrive in challenging circumstances and actually seek the, those out for themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, and but now let's get to another part of the discussion here. So we've already talked about some of the major topics surrounding confidence, overconfidence, underconfidence, and all of those things. So now uh, let me ask you, so what are the, mo the best scientifically validated ways for people to try to calibrate where they fall? So let's say that they are overconfident or underconfident, and so they have to try to tune down or up a little bit their confidence to really properly make uh, good decisions, let's say. Yeah, um, your question's a good one. I, I would offer two thoughts in response. The first one is um, it's probably not worth trying to do some sort of personality diagnosis and uh, figure out whether you're an overconfident sort of person. Mm -hmm. In my search for individual difference correlates of, of overconfidence, I have mostly failed. So there, it's not that there's some people who are just more confident about everything than others, and some people who are just underconfident about everything. Each of us has circumstances in life where we're prone to overconfidence and others who are prone to underconfidence. Mm -hmm. How can you improve your calibration? Mm -hmm. Pay attention to the facts attend to reality, keep track, and keep score. So um, there are circumstances in which we may choose to look away from the facts because we find them distressing or we don't like them. If you care about getting better at calibrating your judgment, you should pay attention to those facts. Mm -hmm. Don't just focus on those investments that you've made that have happened to turn out well. Yeah. systematically examine your entire portfolio. Every time you make a stock trade on a tip, go back and see how those, per, per, those purchases and investments have performed. Are they better than the market index overall? When you make some forecast that your team is going to win a game or that some bet is going to pay off or that some new entrepreneurial venture is going to succeed, how often are you right? If you don't take good notes and keep track and keep score, it can be tempting to be biased in your recollection of the facts. Many people are biased in a positive direction because they like to boast about their successes. But also our failures can weigh inappropriately heavily on us, leading us to ruminate about our shortcomings and our mistakes. But if you just rely on those examples that come most easily to mind, you can be biased in your selection of examples. I encourage people to keep track and keep score. If you care about getting better calibrated, if you care about becoming more accurate, try to get in touch with the facts and don't rely just on your intuitive recollections. Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, uh, just two follow-up questions to that. The first one, I mean, isn't it the case that many times it's hard to really identify what was that we did wrong or did right? Because, I mean, uh, just to give an example, because I guess that virtually all people at least are familiar with these sorts of things. Uh, when, for example, we have an intimate relationship and something goes wrong or something goes right. I mean, there's many different things happening at the same time. It's what you say, how you look, what you wear, and this and that, and also the place you're at and things like that. So, uh, I mean, I guess that many times it's really hard for us to pin down what was there that really led us toward the bad or a good result. Right? Yeah, your example is a poignant one because in so many social settings, it's hard for us to get accurate information. When you ask your ex, what went wrong? <laughs> yeah. Um, if their motivations are complicated and honesty is not necessarily at the very top of that list. They may be trying to protect your feelings or make themselves feel better. So feedback there is complicated. 
Um, there are lots of other consequential domains in which it is easier to implement the advice that I gave, where you have lots of, uh, uh, lots of individual instances and you, it's possible to get pretty clear feedback in each instance. So uh, other examples that I would focus on would include stock investing, where there's a lot of data. You may be investing in lots of different individual companies or different indices, and certainly you have lots of feedback over time. Day to day, we make predictions and often let ourselves get away with being vague in those predictions. Every important decision depends on a prediction. And getting better about making decisions uh, it is, is tremendously facilitated by being, getting better at making predictions. I've worked with companies, for instance, that want to get better at making decisions about which products to launch or how much of a product to produce. And so they have to make forecasts of product demand from their customers in order to figure out how much to produce. Lots of companies do this in a sort of haphazard way and don't keep good records of their accuracy. By keeping good records and trying to learn from each of those successes and failures, they can get better at it. Um, and it an author that I find quite compelling on the topic is Annie Duke, who's written this wonderful book called Thinking in Bets, in which she writes about how poker players learn to get better at forecasting and decision making by getting lots of practice, placing bets, and getting clear evidence afterwards by whether they win or lose at the poker hand. And poker players help each other get better at thinking through probability by inviting each other, want to bet, when someone says something or makes some claim that they're skeptical of. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my last question, uh, you say that one important thing to make, particularly in certain domains of our lives where it's easier to keep track or record of what happens and what works and what doesn't work, uh, I mean, I was just thinking that uh, if you have uh, lots and lots of data to work with, can't you get over time a little bit overconfident <laughs> because you think that you have access to all of the important information out there and you are and with what we, you have you can't get things wrong or something like that yeah uh your question reminds me of the old joke of the drunkard looking for his keys under the street light <laughs> and when asked why are you looking there? He said, well, that's where the light is best, even though he lost his keys somewhere else. Um, we, as, as scientists, it is often tempting to focus on those circumstances where we have good data and neglect the more important circumstances in which the data are not so good. Economists, for instance, focus a great deal on measures of economic productivity like gross domestic product, despite their profound imperfections for measuring the things that actually matter in societal or um, a, nation's wel a nation's welfare. So um, uh, I will concede the point that you make, yes, uh, by paying attention to the, f to the evidence and the numbers and the data, it can uh, distract us from the uh, more important qualitative aspects of decision making. Um, the, that is undeniably true. And I think the lesson is not to give up on quantitative analyses, but instead to try to get better at quantifying and making sense of those aspects of life and uh, uh, subjective experience that actually matter to us. Um, the truth is that every quantitative measure is an imperfect representation of the thing it is intended to capture. GDP is a highly imperfect measure of economic activity and economic mm -hmm. productivity, but it's useful. Mm -hmm. um, we can try to track our own happiness just as we can try to track our own wealth or body weight. And each of those measures will be imperfect, but we can try to get better. And some imperfect measure is better than no measure at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. Moore, let's end on that note and also because I don't want to spoil over your, your entire book. I mean, people nowadays really hate spoilers, so let's, let's keep it down to this. And again, 
um, guys, the book is perfectly confident, um, how to calibrate your decisions wisely. And Dr. Moore, just before we go, would you like to mention some places on the internet or something like that where people can find your work? Yeah, you can find my book uh, with links to pre-ordering it, if you'd like, um, and other information about the book, including uh, citations to relevant evidence and some exercises to help you calibrate your confidence. That's all at www.perfectlyconfident.com. Okay, great. So I'll, I will be leaving links to your work and to the book in the description box of the interview so that, so guys, don't forget to go there and to... Uh, and to give the book a try at least, I really loved it. It's a great read, very interesting. So I recommend it to you all out there. And Dr. Moore, thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. And it was a real pleasure to talk to you. It's been a delight. Thanks for giving me the chance. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. Uh, I have a lot of new patrons now. So uh, I'm trying to get that uh, 100 as soon as it's possible to try to get also at 800 euros of sub monthly support. So let's see if we can get there. I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. And to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there, any amount you feel comfortable with. And otherwise, you can also make a uh, one-time donation on PayPal or also um, you can monthly subscribe on PayPal. I have all the links in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunde, Ricardo Vladimiru, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Marco Neves, Max Bailby, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spigny, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Rob Roberto Inguanzo, Mikel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugney, Alexander Dan Bauer, Omari Hickson, Felicia Stevens, Fergal Cusson, Yevan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, my producers is Arwebi, Rosie, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Dr. Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, and Matthew Lavender, and my executive producer, Michel Ruzieski. Thank you for all. <laughs>